Hello, everybody. My name is Graham Brookie, and I am the director of the Digital Forensic Research Lab here at the Atlantic Council. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's conversation, uh, welcome you virtually, albeit, uh, to this conversation, Reclaiming Reality, De-Radicalization, and Rehabilitation after the January 6th uh, attack. And so I, I'm about to turn it over to the team. We've got a, a, a slate of experts who have unique amounts of expertise and unique uh, perspectives on the spectrum of radicalization uh, that had an impact, a direct impact uh, online, coordinated online first, uh, and two events on the ground uh, in the real world. And so I'm, I'm extremely excited for today's conversation. It's the second in our series of conversations focusing on this nexus between disinformation, platform governance, and domestic extremism, including domestic violent extremism. And so it, one quick point, the January 6th assault on Congress was the direct result of a months long effort rooted in disinformation that was A, promoted by uh, political officials, including the President of the United States, then President of the United States, uh, and coordinated by some of his most fervent and conspiratorial uh, supporters. And in the wake of that attack, uh, there's a number of questions that go to the root of, of where this challenge goes from here. And it's pretty clear that this challenge of domestic violent extremism and its nexus to online disinformation and online movements uh, it doesn't begin and end with one political figure. Uh, it's got a long tail, uh, and it's something that it's a challenge that we're going to be dealing with for the foreseeable future. And so, for us, it's really important to kind of unpack what that looks like, uh, both from a very, very granular standpoint of okay, here's what we've seen on the internet, and here's kind of what that means going forward, but also from a from a ideological standpoint of okay, here's where. Uh, this issue is rooted in history, and here, here's where we think it's going. Um, and so a big piece of that is unpacking what, what I would call the spectrum of radicalization. If you look at the photos of the insurrection that occurred on January 6th, uh, you see one group. And it's really important to note that it wasn't just necessarily one group. It was a number of smaller groups that very important on the spectrum of radicalization. And so I'm very much hoping uh, to learn from those who are participating in today's conversation. Uh, I'm extremely glad that they were able to take time. I'm thankful for them uh, taking the time. I'm also thankful for you taking the time to join this conversation. Uh, and if you want to participate, then uh, please jump in in the chat. We'll be taking an audience Q&A. Uh, and with that, I'd like to turn over to my colleague, Jared Holt, who is leading and coordinating much of the DFI Lab's effort on this set of issues. So with that, over to you, Jared. Thanks for that introduction, Graham. My name is Jared Holt. I'm a resident fellow at the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab. I focus a lot on domestic extremism and how it interacts with the internet. I'm really excited to have you all join us for this conversation today. Uh, it's a topic that's been at the forefront of the national zeitgeist for some time now, uh, due in no small part uh, to the attack on the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. Joining me are three people I respect and admire immensely in this field of work. We've got Amarnath Amar Singham. He's a assistant professor in the School of Religion at Queen's University. We have Christina Lopez, who's a senior research analyst at Data and Society. We've got Travis Bue, who it was one of the earliest researchers of the QAnon uh, conspiracy theory movement and the co-host of a really great podcast called QAnon Anonymous. So first off, Thank you all for joining me. I'm really looking forward to this conversation and I'll remind people who are watching, if you have a question for us about the last 20 to 15 minutes of this hour long conversation, we'll be fielding some questions from the audience. So if you're listening to us speak, you have any questions, any points you would like us to elaborate on, please drop them in the chat and we'll try to answer as many of those as we can in the time that we have. And with that, I'm gonna turn to Amar. The first question that I think we should try to answer here are the distinctions between groups, because it wasn't really one coherent, cohesive group that attacked the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. It was a, a combination of groups. So what lines can we draw between the different groups? And on the flip side, 
what kind of uniting strings tie them all together? Yeah, no, uh, it's a very important question. I think some uh, initial analysis is starting to come out about this as well from the uh, Anti-Defamation League, uh, G George Washington's program on extremism and so on. Um, I think of the, you know, hundreds or so that were uh, analyzed by some of these uh, think tanks, what they basically found was uh, quite a few, somewhere around 25 to 30 percent uh, that we know of so far um, were linked to the Oath Keepers, uh, groups like the Proud Boys, um, Three Percenters, which are kind of much more far right, um, sometimes openly neo-Nazi organizations, um, alt-right groups like the Groiper Army, uh, which is a kind of white supremacist uh, movement linked to Nick Fuentes and, and uh, so on. And then there's this kind of nebulous support uh, for the QAnon movement as well within all wrapped up in this uh, group of people. Uh, the vast majority, at least from the initial analysis, seem to be um, this kind of nebulous pro-Trump MAGA crowd. I mean, it's not entirely sure <clears throat> um, how to think about them yet, right? Is that, are they kind of uh, loosely linked to some of these organizations or are they just kind of, uh, they went there to kind of protest the election outcome, but weren't necessarily uh, self-identified in terms of, <clears throat> in terms of white supremacist or in terms of uh, the far right and so on. Um, I think in terms of similarities, um, one thing to think about is the is the nature of the Trump administration over the last four years and what they've done to kind of public trust in the country, right? And, and so public trust in the media, public trust in government institutions, public trust in medicine, public trust in science um, have all been impacted by the Trump rhetoric um, and has basically opened up um, uh, much more kind of uh, space for a lot of this conspiratorial kind of thinking to take hold. And I think the consequences of that will be seen for some time. So moving on from that, I'll go to Christina now. What's your understanding of the scale of radicalization in the United States, both in terms of extremist movements, things like the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers, and also kind of the general public's complacency, uh, maybe tacit support, we could say fairly, of those kind of extremist ideologies and movements and groups? I think that we have always known that there at some level of extremism has always been prevalent in the fringes and within the spectrum, like Ram said earlier, within the spectrum of radicalization, you will always see that there will be certain avenues or pathways towards radicalization. What we are seeing right now is the ability to scale that up and the ability of finding different pathways towards radicalization. We definitely have seen this scale as, as content and content that contains radical ideologies starts permeating and becomes a lot more mainstream, a lot more easy to find. And one of the details that I think is really interesting in terms of assessing the scale is that you have a structure of permission, of normalization that wasn't present before that you could identify specifically uh, a Trump administration that was never very keen on establishing where the boundaries were and what was permissible to do and, and which groups were actually on the extremism side. There was a lot of opportunistic use of these groups and these affiliations when it was convenient and when it wasn't. And so I do think that the the permission structure that habilitated a lot of folks that would have not allowed themselves to be in a situation where violence was normalized was uh, advanced definitely through social media and definitely through some cable networks. So building on the point that Christina just made, Travis, um, you know, online radicalization does not exist in a vacuum. It has all kinds of different arms and legs that reach into other parts of our society, including specifically news media and uh, you know politics itself. As Christina was saying, the Trump administration throughout the 2016 campaign and even throughout its administration never really seemed to be very keen on establishing a firm line between what would be considered fringe and what was permissible. I'm curious in your experience and your research, how have you seen political influences? I'm talking media figures, 
activists, politicians, uh, how have they influenced the general temperature within extremist or conspiracy driven movements online? Sure. I mean, um, well, speaking of like QAnon specifically, I mean, what, what energizes QAnon followers more than anything else, in my experience, is validation. Uh, they they love, uh, you know, feeling like they are uh, making an impact. They're influencing powerful people in some uh, significant way. And this can come in, come in the f form of either praise or opposition. When we're talking about praise. I think what's, you, you, uh, what's unique about QAnon is that it uh, is that the QAnon followers receive praise uh, directly from President Trump. Uh, Trump said that uh, QAnon followers are people who love the country, people who are very much uh, against pedophilia, um, and uh, it's also received uh, validation. And the fact that QAnon followers uh, love validation has been obviously been exploited by some bad actors who are able to build an audience by giving these people validation and sort of uh, ensuring that they are, you know. That they are uh, that they are on the right track, and this this opposition that this validation can also come in the form of sort of uh, news media coverage that sort of uh, that paints them that paints them in certain ways because they they love to be opposed because they love this comes from the, their their basic troll ethos their their uh, the fact that it was first formed on 4chan they love uh, they love getting a reaction out of people. Uh, because they essentially they imagine themselves to be digital warriors who are fighting an information war to get out the truth. So in that sense, um, you know, if there's a certain kind of media coverage that paints them in a certain way, they really, really, really love. And this is, by the way, why I think it's really important that uh, uh, that some media coverage really uh, emphasizes narratives about the pain that being a member of QAnon uh, involves and um, in, and uh, the pass out. There's a there's a woman named Ashley Vanderbilt who is a former QAnon follower who's making a round making the rounds talking about her uh, journey getting out of QAnon, which I think is a uh, more more productive way in uh, in recovering this topic. Yeah, I think that that makes an important point. Uh, oftentimes, the people that are plunging down these rabbit holes, something I've been trying to stress is that many of them believe that they're doing a good thing that they are fighting for, you know, they think that they're heroes fighting to save the country, right? But unfortunately, this comes with very devastating effects to their personal relationships, sometimes their employment, et cetera. Amar, I'm gonna take it back to you. Uh, you know, now that we've kind of established the state of play, I wanna start to shift the conversation towards trying to maybe change things or, or you know, salvage some of this. Uh, you know. Is it possible to get individuals pulled away from delusions like QAnon or extremist ideologies and eventually rehabilitate them to be, you know, productive members of society who, you know, are, are no longer dangerous? And is there any sort of established patterns on ways that are effective at getting people out of these movements? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a tough question because a lot of the research that exists on disengagement or de-radicalization um, is usually linked to groups like Al-Qaeda or ISIS or, you know, uh, much more hardcore kind of neo-Nazi groups. Um, and what we know from that research, if um, and I'm not sure that the findings of that are entirely applicable with a group like QAnon, or with a movement like QAnon, let's say, um, you know, one of the reasons that a lot of people leave is losing faith in the ideology, right? And, and so uh, the, the kind of... Black, and what you hear from a lot of former neo-Nazis, for example, is that living constantly in this kind of black and white worldview where the in-group is constantly embattled and whether, where you're constantly at war with this kind of out-group becomes exhausting, right? It, it, after 5, 10, 15 years in, the, in, in, a, in, a, in that kind of environment, um, it, can quite, it, it can be quite um, exhausting. And so another reason people leave and, and, and cracks start to form is significant others come into their life. And so, you know, there's often the story that uh, a friend of mine tells who was a former neo-Nazi that w he spent his entire life thinking that Jewish people were uh, secretly controlling the world. And then when he when he actually met one, um, that started him on the path out of the movement. And so that's kind of, you know, uh, losing faith in the ideology becomes one of the reasons. Um, a second is uh, group uh, like leadership failure, which um, in this in the sense of QAnon, um, I'm not sure what that looks like, or, or you know. So, it, it, so it, you're you're kind of told that members of your in-group, members of your movement, are honorable, selfless, um, authentic people, and then um, once they start backstabbing, once they start uh, showcasing their selfishness, um, and and that that can often lead to people leaving these movements. 
Um, and the other one, which um, often isn't talked about, is is just kind of battle fatigue, burnout, aging, getting older, um, wanting to kind of move on with your life, um, which I think we might see more of in the QAnon space um, as we go forward. But um, a lot of the findings, I guess, in the DRAD disengagement space um, are, are going to be neat, are going to have to be adapted to deal with some of these more nebulous kind of fringe conspiracy movements, because it's not entirely um, a one-to-one -one ratio. The other thing I'll say is um, the, m much of the research does draw a distinction between de-radicalization and disengagement, right? And so if our ultimate goal is to just prevent these people from engaging in acts of violence, it might be that they continue to believe certain things, right? It might be that they continue to believe in um, crazy ideas, but they just have found another avenue to, by which to address these grievances and, and, and um, talk about them. Um, and so we need to decide as a society whether we're okay with uh, millions of people um, continuing to believe crazy things as long as they don't um, do anything about it. So that distinction, I think, is uh, important as well. Travis, I'll, I'll go to you, Amar. That's a, a really great point, distinguishing between de-radicalization and disengagement. But Travis, uh, you know, as far as QAnon goes, because, you know, QAnon is not a, I guess, traditionally structured extremist movement, uh, you know, the type of things that have been studied in the past, like uh, Amar was talking about. I guess drawing from your personal experience and your personal uh, witness and research on some sort of, uh, you know, delusion that's grown to a massive scale like this. Have you seen any trend lines and what's effective in getting people to unplug? Like, I, I guess what I'm wondering is, is, is it possible to either de-radicalize or disengage at any sort of large scale with, you know, using something like QAnon as an example? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, it's really important to just, like draw a distinction between de-radicalization and disengagement because it's one of the things that's just very unique and uh, I, but also kind of troubling about QAnon is even though uh, it has, according to polling, possibly tens of millions of adherents just to this this country, uh, the, the, the casualties that are directly as a result of QAnon is actually much, much lower than some other domestic extremist groups. So they're actually very uh, generally lightly engaged. Now, that's not to downplay the threat or anything like that, or but uh, just just comparatively, um, they have um, they have uh, few, fewer fewer casualties. Um, but I think that what, what's kind of unique about QAnon followers is that they seem to always fold whenever they 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 engage any kind whenever they come uh, come up across any kind of serious consequences we we see this repeatedly um for example uh there's Ed, uh was it Edgar Madison Welch who was the uh Pizzagate follower who was uh, sort of the, which was the predecessor to Pizzagate to uh, QAnon uh who fired that shot into comet comet ping pong and served a, a couple of years in prison as a consequence of that um he wrote an apology letter there's also the case of Matthew Wright um who was uh charged with uh convicted of terrorism uh, um, for uh, having an armed standoff on the Hoover Dam Bridge, also wrote an apology letter. A letter. There's a uh, Jacob Chansley, uh, aka the, who's better known as the Q Shaman, uh, who is, uh, according to his lawyer, at least very apologetic. Um, now, yeah, you may uh, consider these be simply defense strategies, but it's not a given that an extremist will fold and apologize for their actions and uh, walk back what they did, and then, and then, in some cases, in the case of Jacob Chansley, um, say that they've been disillusioned with President Trump as a consequence of that. So uh, there are many cases of extremists who are defiant and unapologetic. Take, for example. Example, um, uh, the neo-Nazi group Golden Dawn. After a few of their members were convicted in Greece, uh, they were they were still very very defiant. So it seems what I think was helpful about QAnon, at least, is is the fact that uh, whenever they bump into the real world, at least, they seems that they um, they they are willing to. Uh, not engage with that that belief system as much or anymore, or profess belief in that that that, that belief system. That's not to suggest that incarceration or anything like that is a solution to the problem, but it does suggest I think that their beliefs are a lot more loosely held uh, at the end of the day uh, than some other more violent extremist groups. Christina, I want to go to you because a lot of the conversation that tends to take place, whether it's on cable news channels, social media, 
and probably rightfully so, is focused on social media. Uh, a lot of this conversation revolves around things like deplatforming, moderation. You said something at the opening of the panel that I, I want to ask you to elaborate on, which is, you know, what is social media's role in scaling radicalization? Because, you know, it, like you mentioned, extreme groups have existed seemingly forever. Um, but their prominence and uh, the spotlight on them has grown and so have their numbers or seemingly numbers of sympathizers. So this is a this is a tricky thing to answer without trying to give media effects like the the ability of immediately convincing anyone that watches something of what media is saying and we have through through years moved away from that ex media theory like media effects theory that folks just believe automatically everything they they read or consume in media but we understand that in order to be persuasive the media that is persuasive is that that has a social component a a positive social interaction and that together with the messaging can be more persuasive and what you see with social media is that you have given influencers the ability of creating these parasocial relationships with huge swaths of the population, with gigantic audiences. And what that's, what this creates is that you have a message that is together coupled with that positive social interaction, with that ability of creating community. The, the socio-effective component of being pulled into these groups, I don't think we can leave it behind. It's, it's just as important, I believe, as the ideological component or of where you lie in terms of, of the spectrum right or left. It's important because a lot of these folks, you could identify that they were vulnerable to you know, this sort of influence because of, of other voids, socially effective, and, and the fact that they find a community and establish a parasocial relationship with a figure that they start trusting, that in this case, you know, can be a, a lot of influencers um, and, and micro celebrities within this huge um, group of very, distinct and diverse people. And so I think that that you can't abandon the that side of the analysis that, that at the end of the day, like, yes, this is media that is being consumed that has certain effects, but it wouldn't be as powerful if it wasn't for the socio-effective, the, the parasocial relationships that social media allows micro celebrities to create with, with huge audiences. The other thing too is that Often, if we only focus on um, social media, we leave aside the social component, the, the community creation, the, the ways in which these movements act a lot like a fandom and in the ways in which the riot in a lot of ways was a, a manifestation in real life of a lot of just content being produced and being consumed. And I think it's interesting that we started by kind of distinguishing between the radicalization and disengagement. I think engagement um, as it relates to social media is kind of at the, at, at the center of this. A lot of this rhetoric has escalated and reached a lot of people because of its ability to draw engagement or awaken a reaction in audiences. I think that in a lot of ways, it is the incentives that have been put to keep folks engaged that have had some impact in the ways that rhetoric has radicalized a lot of folks or that has escalated from normalizing positions that would have been untenable before. And a quick follow-up question for you, Christina. Uh, you know, as a Democrat in the Biden administration, they you know, in reaction to January 6th, have made these statements about wanting to take domestic extremism seriously as an issue in this country. You know, I'm, I'm curious your general thoughts on, you know, there's a variety of ways to fight that, right? There's the tech component, there's the local community component, there's, you know, a, to extent, a law enforcement component. Like, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on, you know, given social media's kind of would it be fair to say enabling role uh, in in swelling the size of this issue? Kind of what degree, like like how should 
you know, a administration that wants to tackle this issue meaningfully think about the role of social media in gearing and designing its approach to this issue. I think that it starts by looking at this as a complex problem that you can't police your way out of. You can't surveil necessarily your way out of. I think I agree with your assessment that for a long time, the importance or the influence of radical domestic extremism has not been taken seriously. Um, I I do think that to a degree, the there has been a a wishful thinking perhaps, but a willingness to be a lot more forgiving uh, when terrorism looks white, when it's domestically grown, um, when it's being manifested as just a lot of charged rhetoric. I think that that changing how, so like, changing in general how law enforcement is assessing these groups is necessary, but it's not the only way. And only policing would would have terrible consequences. I think that in terms of social media, we have to go back to thinking, why do people post at all? There's a component of self-presentation that you are performing online. And there's a a component that is, you know, being part of a group, the the reinforcement of a group identity. And I think the reinforcement of of, of group identity has become crucial lately. And that united sense of grievance has indeed moved a lot of people to organize and mobilize in ways that we hadn't seen, seen before. But they all stem from what we are doing online, which is just self-presenting ourselves and reinforcing our identity and our belonging to certain groups. And and from that, I think that we can start talking about the role of social media in enabling perhaps not the the extremism or the ideology, which already existed, but in giving it crucial tools to amplify, reach, and normalize, allowing a lot of people to connect and, and with similarly you know, aligned folks that they wouldn't have found otherwise. So I think that there is definitely that component of platform governance that we cannot ignore. We know that the platforming has positive effects, but it can't be the only tool. It is a blunt uh, approach and it has unintended consequences. So we have to include some nuance in how we approach these things. We have to look at what monetizing or demonetizing can do for the escalating uh, rhetoric. We have to look at what is the role that algorithmic amplification is playing here and what is the role that recommendation algorithms are playing in allowing a lot of groups with distinct identities to coalesce around one big idea and move and mobilize in the real world towards achieving something. We have to also identify which ways the, which are flags that we can look at in in terms of social media users that can inform a little bit where a person is in their journey of radicalization. Is it time that they're spending online? Is it interactions? Is it isolation in their real life, in the real world communities? So these are complex problems and policing alone is not going to get us out of this. And Amara, I saw you unmute for just a second there. Did you want to chime in on this? Yeah, no, I I mean, uh, to to kind of add to Christina's point, I think we we need to step back a little bit to ask why some of these messages are resonating, right? And and I often use the example of the uh, of the guy at the corner holding an end is near sign. Um, Usually he's just there by himself. But if I if I were to go two weeks from now and all of a sudden there's a hundred people around him, I wouldn't ask about the message, right? The messages remain the same for the entire two weeks. It's just now more people are listening to it. So then the question becomes, why are they listening to it? What changed in the last two weeks to make this message resonate more? And so I think we do need to ask a kind of society wide question of what is, why are these movements on the rise? Why is conspiratorial thinking on the rise? Um, Part of it is, you know, uh, we saw a huge spike in the pandemic where um, it it, kind of had a disruption effect on a lot of people's sense of normalcy. Um, And so we do need to ask a kind of broader question of of the messages often remain the same. I mean, the KKK from uh, from the early 20th century is uh, the the message of the far right hasn't particularly changed, but the demand has changed over time. And so um, why what what is leading to some of these messages resonating more now than they did, you know, 
five, 10 years ago. Um, and so I, I, and I, the, the second point is um, we have this kind of tendency to think that DRAD programs are somehow a post 9-11 invention, but keep in mind, like the Norway exit program designed for the neo-Nazi community, neo-Nazi community was dates back to 1997. The Swedish program dates back to 1998. And so we do have kind of um, uh, examples of how this has been done in other parts of the world that might be useful for uh, using domestically as well. That pivots uh, to my next question, which is for you, actually, which is, you know, a lot of people are maybe hearing about CVE, as it's called, Countering Violent Extremism Programs, Practices, Initiatives for the first time after January 6th attack on the Capitol. Can you give us a landscape of kind of what is out there, what's been tried, what works, what doesn't, and kind of what the limitations or the gaps might be there? Sure. Yeah, it's a big question, but I mean, I think um, that the conversation about CVE in the U.S. in particular started around 2004, um, and then you had several programs and policies put into place post uh, 2011. Um, over time, you had a kind of very law enforcement centric approach, but then that got scaled back uh, with what became known as the uh, Disruption and Early Engagement Project, which or, or DEEP, um, which tried very hard to say, okay, you know the people that we're dealing with, the people that we're looking at are a problem. They are kind of going down certain rabbit holes that we don't like, but they haven't necessarily crossed the legal threshold for arrest. So do we just kind of abandon them to the community and, and go about our way? Or is there some way to kind of um, do some sort of intervention that might help here? And, and, and so I think there have been different initiatives um, across the country that have tried to do that. Um, the kind of pushback that we've seen over time for CVE um, the largest complaint, of course, is that it was entirely focused on the Muslim community. Um, and so a lot of the Muslim activist groups and NGOs complained about government overreach, um, uh, targeting and so on. Uh, when Life After Hate, one of the uh, main groups in the U.S. that deals with kind of far right formers, um, lost its funding uh, in 2016, that was used as evidence for why uh, this is, you know, this is very much the case that the entire focus of the CVE uh, programming is focused on the Muslim community. Um, the other kind of difficulty that I think will still um, approach within the Biden administration is the relationship between CVE programs as, as, with government and law enforcement. A lot of these programs are run by government or run by law enforcement or funded by the government. Um, and that, of course, within the Muslim community has led to a lot of distrust about true intentions of these programs and so on, which I think will be likely replicate, le replicated um, if we're dealing with the far right and, uh, as well. Um, the other thing that we've talked about earlier is a lot of these programs are targeted towards young people. Um, and so the vast majority of CVE programming deals with kind of 20 year old young men who are drawn to, you know, either neo-Nazi groups or um, jihadist groups. And I think particularly now with the changing landscape, we're seeing a lot of people who are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, who are drawn to these movements. And it's, an, it's not entirely clear what a CVE program looks like for a 60 year old, right? And and so um, whether we're talking about mentorship programs and after school programs, none of that is relevant anymore. Um, and so the, the, I think the Biden administration is going to have to think through um, the changing landscape of extremism and then how to do that in a way that doesn't kind of replicate the mistakes of the last uh, decade or so. So this last one, I'll open this up to the whole panel. Um, you know, what lessons do existing U.S. CVE practices offer for the Biden administration? Or actually, I'll zoom this out. Actually, you know, the fight against domestic extremism isn't necessarily a new thing. It's also maybe, arguably, not entirely equipped for the scale or the variety of causal factors that are happening here. What practices that have, have been going on recently can the Biden administration learn from? Also, on the flip side of that, is there anything uh, like related to messaging that maybe the Biden administration should avoid? Travis, I'll start with you because I've seen, you know, listening to QAnon Anonymous, your show, I've, I've heard you all talk on occasion about ways that politicians or uh, you know, media outlets have described or discussed QAnon in ways that 
didn't seem particularly helpful. Yeah, um, I think that, yeah, I think whenever I yeah I approach sort of the QAnon radicalization, uh, I always approach, I always uh, talk about in, in the ways in which it is it, which is a, a tragedy because again these these QAnon followers they want to be heroic they want to think that they're doing battle and they want to feel like they're arm in arm with allies and they're supporting absolute evil and then in this in this sense um i know that there's a lot of um you know uh, sometimes we get critiqued for because we it, we act as if that we are you know too sympathetic to people who are who are radicalized in some sense but we have to remember uh sometimes acting sympathetic towards some of these q and followers especially when they aren't actually uh, uh particularly dangerous is the most irritating thing you can do towards them but it's also uh very very effective uh because it shows them that there that there that there is that there is a, a sort of a path out um yeah i mean it, it's it's very very uh you know uh challenging I, yeah i would just say that yeah the the best um sort of way to talk about it is the, is to emphasize the pain that comes with believing this nonsense and to you know encourage other people who are perhaps um who are who are affected family members of QAnon followers uh to to you know to reach out to them as as family members as friends because this is really the most effective way that uh we, that we've seen people get out you know it's like they're not going to listen to uh, a podcast host and they're probably not going to listen to some government bureaucrat but they will often listen to a family member who cares about them not always it sucks but uh, that is the often the best chance of getting someone to realize that they are on the wrong path i'll go to you christina you know are there any practices to countering extremism that you've seen that you thought were particularly effective that maybe you know a biden administration or democrats seeking to counter this should take note of or on the inverse, anything you've seen that you didn't think was effective? I think that I, w I want to echo Travis here in that I do not think that a reaction that demonizes those who haven't crossed the threshold from the radical ideology towards violence, like before they have crossed, you know, the, the threshold of illegality, I do not think that rhetoric that fully demonizes these in many cases, victims of uh, someone else's exploits of social media affordances um, is the right way. Because just like a, a structure of permission was needed for some folks to cross over from, you know, being kind of a passive observer of right wing politics and a consumer of right wing media towards being in person at a violent event. And so I do think that there is also a need for a better conversation in a, in a permission structure for folks that want to take a step back and rejoin society and and, main, and the mainstream in a way. And, and that helps through rhetoric. I do think that the Biden administration has a huge challenge um, when it comes to CBE approaches, mostly because like Amarin said, a lot of the times these are these are policies and programs that are led from law enforcement. And in a lot of ways, radicalization has also affected our law enforcement groups. And, and that is also something that an administration like the Biden administration will have to contend with and figure out how how this works when the some of the you know forces that have been traditionally occupied for CVE approaches individuals within them are on the radical side and so that that's another challenge that i think um the administration has to transparently deal with and tamar to you sure um yeah i mean i think I, I think a lot of what i see going forward as as probably necessary kind of immediately is is um very up, upstream initiatives right um and things that that people kind of roll their eyes at now digital literacy um uh things like that where and and kind of rebuilding trust in some of these government and social institutions that have basically been decimated over the last uh, four years or so. Trust in medicine, <clears throat> trust in science, trust in the media, trust in government. 
Um, we know what there's mountains of studies on conspiratorial thinking that that basically show that there are real world consequences to believing these things, right? People tend to vote less. People tend to not vaccinate their kids. People tend to not volunteer or do any kind of civic engagement. Um, and so I, I think the long-term consequences for kind of democratic functioning in the US uh, from from the mainstreaming of these kinds of ideas is going to be immense. And and, and so I, I'm I'm less concerned, I think, about the kind of people who are radicalized, because there are already programs that that kind of address some of those individuals, but I'm more concerned about the mainstream loss of trust and um, uh, kind of conspiratorial thinking that has in infected mainstream society, which I think is going to have deep um, consequences. Um, on, on the kind of individual level, I do think we need to, because there's so many, <laughs> I do need to think, I do need to, I, I think we need to kind of um, disaggregate whether we're talking about hardcore members of these groups, um, kind of supporters and sympathizers. We know from the uh, studies of kind of Al Qaeda and, and jihadist groups that um, the nature of individual involvement is fundamentally important, uh, or understanding the nature of involvement is fundamentally important for de-radicalization. If you're talking to just, some, just someone who's kind of hanging out at the edges of these groups, your approach to them to get them out of these groups is going to be very different than if they have some sort of leadership role, right? And so um, I think just understanding the landscape of some of what's happening is, is going to be quite important because unlike uh, Al Qaeda supporters in the US, which is um, which is minuscule, um, this is a, a kind of massive problem. Um, and so uh, that's going to be difficulty going difficult going forward. As Travis mentioned, I think getting families involved is quite important. And the Norway kind of exit program did that um, quite effectively. The challenge, much like what Christina said, is that um, if you're dealing with groups like uh, the Oath Keepers or whatever, um, sometimes the families are the ones who taught the young people these ideas to begin with. And so um, you're going to have kind of an added difficulty there, just like you would with law enforcement involvement. So, on the optimistic note. <laughs> All right. Yeah, on that, on that cheery note, um, we've got, it looks like 17 minutes left for this Q&A, and we have more questions than minutes available to us. So I've asked, uh, you know, one of the folks working on the behind the scenes here to funnel me a couple of questions that, and we'll try to get to as many as we can before we sign off at the end of the hour. Travis, this one is for you. It's about QAnon. What do you make of the moving the goalposts that Q groups are currently doing? You know, QAnon believers said that the inauguration would result in Trump being inaugurated. Now, you know, there's this channeling of a weird sovereign citizen movement kind of theory about March 4th. You know, what should we make, or, or let me see, let me reread this real quick. How do people who believe in QAnon deal with the constant changing of dates and the constant pushing of these goalposts? You're muted, Travis. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, moving the goalposts has always been a feature of QAnon from day one. I mean, literally the very first uh, Q drop predicts the imminent arrest of Hillary Clinton. Now, so back in 2017, that didn't happen. And they've been moving the goalposts ever since. I mean, I would turn to obviously uh, the research on cognitive dissonance about this. I mean, the, the point, the point isn't the predictions. I mean, the predictions really don't matter. What they get out of QAnon isn't a feeling like they know the future. It's really more the group identity. The feeling like they are on a journey uh, combating evil with a group of patriots. This is what they this is what they get out of it more than anything else. Um, so, like the I'm actually uh, I mean, generally I'm least concerned about the people who continually move the goalposts because because then at least they they're still a, they're still sort of continue to believe that some other outside force will make the revolutionary changes that they want to happen. What concerns me a little bit is the people who stop trusting the plan, stop believing that there's going to be some sort of outside force because that may motivate them to take actions into their own hands. So, I mean, they will, they will, some of them will move the goalposts for the rest of their lives. So that's not, that's just something that they're going to do. Another to question. That, sorry, just jumping oh, in. Yeah. There's also the fact that within the QAnon movement, there is a lot of entrepreneurial um, meaning making in that every person that is, a, or people who are a part of it, 
are involved in their own trying to make sense of whatever the clues were and connecting the dots on their own. And so when the when the goalposts get moved, often the the end conclusion isn't necessarily that they have been duped. It's that they didn't connect the dots appropriately. And because it baked into the movement is you have to trust the plan. The trust is implicit and it doesn't it doesn't go missing whenever the plan doesn't get executed. And this one, I'll, I'll toss it to the group if anyone wants to try. Um, would you call Antifa and Black Lives Matter extremist organizations? The person who asked this question says, on the same day as the attack on the Capitol, there were assaults on government buildings in Seattle and Portland. Does anyone want to tackle that? Um, I'll give it a go. <laughs> um, I don't. I don't. From from kind of the available evidence, I wouldn't call them uh, extremist organizations. I think first of all, they're not. Most of them aren't organizations. <clears throat> um, BLM uh, does have organizational kind of um, elements to it, but Antifa definitely doesn't. Um, and the other the other point I think is a lot of the violence that we've seen from these groups are very protest related and very much against um, uh, groups that show up uh, to counter protest. Um, and so we haven't necessarily seen, as far as I could tell, um, kind of independently organized or independently launched attacks against government institutions or civilians to kind of um, bring about their cause. And so I think um, by, by the definition of extremism that we generally go by, I don't think they fit. I, well, I would just answer that with no. Um, I would also say that the false equivalences that got made in trying to draw these as mirror images of two extreme problems that are, you know, present at both ends of the, of the spectrum was what I meant when I talked about a permission structure that, you know, was pushed by cable news. And if you were looking at the coverage of Antifa or Black Lives Matter BLM protests throughout the summer of 2020, you would have seen that folks who were only watching, for example, Fox News, would have assumed that the prevalence of violence in, in protesting and in, in within these movements was a lot more widespread than actually individual exceptions. And that is in part what, what brought a lot of folks to believe that, well, this is nothing compared to what we've been seeing all summer that those false equivalences were really damaging in allowing a lot of people to, to cross that line from what they saw as permissible to acting on a lot of really bad information. Then uh, Travis, do you wanna jump in or should I jump on to this next question? You can jump to the next question. All right, uh, this one is about deplatforming. Will migration to alt tech platforms, particularly decentralized ones, increase the scale of domestic extremism? What happens when we can no longer deplatform and ban radical users from mainstream social platforms? Um, I haven't said much. Maybe I can try to answer this. So, when extremists move from mainstream to alternative tech platforms, this is something I've written a bit about at DFR Lab, it's kind of a double-edged sword. On one hand, the ability for those extremist groups or you know, individuals spreading disinformation or lies drops significantly. They are unable to poison the well, if you will. Um, so it has a pretty a uh, devastating impact often in that respect. In another respect, to the degree that there is coherent organizing happening, whether it's Facebook groups or event pages, uh, networks of individuals, taking those networks offline can have a immediate destabilizing effect. Um, you know, I think that a lot of the social media action against extremist groups after January 6th and the attack on the Capitol probably played a contributing factor in the fact that nothing was able to be significantly organized around Joe Biden's inauguration. I, I don't think that is, you know, a completely discountable piece of the puzzle there. Um, but when people moved to these alternative platforms, a lot of them were first adopted by 
very hardcore extremist that got the ban hammer was like years ago and it got you know shown the curve on social media as something i keep telling people is that radical extremists on a lot of these alternative platforms have the home field advantage so you have these people that you know were existing on these mainstream platforms essentially walking straight into an incubator promising no censorship and then on the other side of the door is all kinds of people and forces that want nothing more than to radicalize a larger audience further so there's some risks um as far as the scale of domestic extremism i i haven't seen a whole lot to suggest it increases the scale of it um but it it does it could potentially accelerate things and some of that is you know gonna we're just gonna unfortunately have to wait and see what happens uh, if i had a crystal ball i would rub it and look into it and tell you what it said right now um but that's my answer to that. If anyone wants to jump in or otherwise, I'll get to the next question. All right, next question. Uh, Christina, this seems like a good one for you. The vast majority of those in extremist or conspiratorial movements distrust news organizations and the role of journalism in informing the public. Instead of writing reports and fact checks that have no impact on members of such groups, how do you think journalists who report on extremism and conspiracies should reach out to radicalized believers? That depends on what you think the role of a journalist is. And I think in a media landscape like what we have right now, where journalists individually are really constrained in terms of resources, they are having to cover a lot more ground in terms of the beats that they cover. They are in a lot of ways um, constrained by the demands for, for content too, the, the same demands for content that anyone creating content on the internet has. So to on top of informing the public and, and you know, combined with all these demands of content in a really precarious economical position, we also add that it's on them to, to reach out and, and de radicalize. I think that would be an, an unrealistic uh, role to put on individual journalists. However, I do think that journalists who are covering this beat in this day and age should have learned a lot from the, the rise of radicalism in, on the internet in 2014, 2015, and should have learned a lot about what we know are the strategies that groups use to manipulate media. And, that includes, you know, the the amplifying small scale uh, groups or small scale content online and giving it a mainstream voice. That has terrible effects for, you know, getting folk getting ideas in front of the eyeballs of folks that would have not seen them before. It also creates this uh, perception of antagonism uh, between media and the aggrieved, you know, aggrieved radicals that has been weaponized by a lot of this micro celebrities micro influencers who are kind of competing with journalists for content into creating a us versus them uh identity and in that sense that is really dangerous for democracy because we no longer share a a, a reality and I think that there are a lot of folks that are doing amazing work in uncovering the house and the strategies and the crucial players and putting the responsibility where it should be in in terms of platform governance, in terms of the individual responsibility that folks with gigantic audiences have. I think there's journalists doing an amazing job at that. But I also think that there's a lot of damage that can be done in covering these issues as a both sides problem or as a false equivalence or in in claiming that there's no real damage uh, that radicalization brings to individuals who are radicalized. I think that a, a, a compassionate approach is necessary, but also that the expectations are not put in the members of the media or journalists to do this de-radicalizing work because it, it's unrealistic. And Amar, as a uh, assistant professor in a school of religion, I think 
that. Uh, this would be a great question for you. Uh, the person who wrote this question says, one thing that I have not heard uh, us discuss is the role of Christian nationalism in the events of January 6th. The, pers the person who wrote the question wrote, the Jesus flags were there alongside the Confederate and the Trump flags. What are the implications for what churches should be watching for? I think that's really interesting because religious communities are huge communities in the country. Um, so whatever intersection of this topic and the religious communities uh, you might have insights on, love to hear. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think I think one thing to keep in mind is um, kind of American politics has always been infused with religion, has always been infused with kind of apocalyptic kind of thinking um, going back uh, quite a while. And so, you know, communism used to be thought of as the product of Satan. Um, uh, Henry Kissinger was thought of, thought to be uh, the Antichrist and so on. And, I, and, and so I think a lot of the a lot of the kind of evangelical uh, politicized kind of religious identity that exists in the U.S. is part of what's allowing groups like QAnon even um, to resonate, right? And I think, uh, the, the, and so that that kind of element is is constantly present um, on the on the kind of much more far right Christian identity kind of movements um, are also quite prevalent um, and and we're actively seen um, on January sixth. And I I do think there, there's been a lot of pushback, I guess, from congregations, uh, particularly in Baptist churches and neo charismatic churches, um, to groups like QAnon to basically say. Um, these kinds of things are seeping into our congregations. They're being sent uh, conspiratorial documents and, and uh, conspiratorial thinking. So to keep an eye out for it. Um, on the kind of new age front, you're also seeing um, uh, QAnon ideas seep into uh, new age beliefs, again, mixed with kind of distrust in big pharma, distrust in vaccines, distrust in medicine and so on. Um, so I do think uh, you're seeing a lot of these ideas seep into different elements of religious communities that form the kind of tapestry of American religion. But I, and but it, so um, yeah, it, 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 it's always been part and parcel of what religion in the U.S. has been about. So we are running up on the end of the hour here. Um, I just very quickly scrolled through the Q and A chat, and there's a lot of good questions. And if we had all day, uh, you know, I'm sure we would we would have fun uh, sitting down and answering them. But Unfortunately, we are coming up on the end of the hour. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Well, I have one last closing question, and I'll open it up to the whole panel, SparkNotes style. What do you anticipate in the next 90 days to six months in the wake of the Capitol riot? Additionally, do you see a path forward for public-private partnerships that can aid in de-radicalization and fighting disinformation offline in a way that doesn't trample civil liberties. Um, massive question for thirty seconds. Um, <laughs> the, I, I mean, I think a lot of that groundwork has already been laid with with the fight against ISIS, for example, ISIS online, <clears throat> and so a lot of the lessons learned from that period can be applied and and continued with with what we're seeing now with the far right. Um, there are problems there, which will take a long time to unpack, but um, I do think there are lessons there going forward. There might be an opportunity to, right now that the attention is on the topic, like force for more accountability of social platforms while knowing that that is not the only solution and that that is not the only way. And uh, Travis, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a, that's a very difficult question. Um, yeah, I think that yeah, moving forward again, I think more outreach and more um, sort of a, a understanding, providing paths and stories about de-radicalization, I think is the best thing that the, the media can do at least. Yeah, and, and to the respect of the next uh, 90 days to six months, I think it was, um, you know, currently, the far right and extremist right is in a, a kind of a state of suspension right now, if you will. Um, you know, this universal condemnation, federal scrutiny, deplatforming, law enforcement investigations. It's kind of put things in a weird spot for them. Eventually, though, it will come together and it will 
kick back into gear and probably sooner than a lot of us think. So, um, you know, something I've been stressing to people is having the conversations now and doing the, you know, taking the actions that we can in this moment to make sure the next time something like January 6th happens, that we're better prepared. And I think this kind of conversation is the perfect place to start. It's, the, it's exactly the kind of conversation we should be having both within government, uh, civil society, and also, you know, more broadly speaking. So with that, we're coming up on the end of the hour. I want to give a big thank you to our panelists, Christina Lopez, Travis View, and Amarnat Amarsingham. So thank you all for joining. Uh, and yeah, take, take care. Thank you for have having a, me. Ha have a great afternoon and the rest of the day. And from the DFR lab to the audience, Thanks for joining.